you doing, Mets fans? And welcome to another edition of the Terry Collins Show, presented by Tunnel to Towers, supporting America's greatest heroes. Donate just $11 a month by going to T2T.org. I'm John Arezzi, and joining me from Port St. Lucie, Florida, the former skip of the New York Mets, analyst for SNY's Baseball Night in New York, Mr. Terry Collins. Terry, welcome back from New York. Thank you, John. Thank you. I'm glad to get back and uh, have some fun doing the podcast. We've got some uh, great guests today. We've got a great guest next week, so it's exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, um, good stay in New York. The weather was spectacular, so it made it, made it nice to be up there. Awesome. Uh, we do have a good one, as you mentioned today, by popular demand. We will be bringing on, on our Talking with TC segment, the longtime radio voice for the New York Mets, Howie Rose. Yeah, I'm excited to have Holly on. He's the best. I mean, he is, uh, you know, of course, he's got a golden voice, Hall of Famer. And I got the opportunity to do some games with him the last couple of years. And I'm going to tell you, you talk about a learning experience. You know, I, I, you know, I, I'm from, from the field, you think that job's easy. But when you get up there and see the job they really have to do, he, and he's the best at it. So I'm really excited to have him on. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to Howie, and uh, he's certainly one of my all-time favorites, and I uh, can't wait for you guys to get into it on Talking with TC. But let's talk about the Mets, who are back after two days uh, in that big series in London, England. They split the two-game series across the pond with the team in the best record in the National League, the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, the series had a playoff atmosphere, uh, and I'm sure that Major League Baseball was happy with the event. Over 100,000 fans attended over the two days. Uh, what did you think of the series and the international initiative uh, by Major League Baseball to bring baseball over to London? Well, first of all, I thought the series was a good series. I mean, it was very, very entertaining. Uh, Sunday's game was really a great game. I mean, for the Mets to come back and win that game. And, and I know there was a lot of action and stuff, but I will tell you, I'll go back to in the ninth inning, the best at bat was – Tyrone Taylor's leading off, you know, that nine pitch base on balls to start the inning was a great, great at bat. And then, of course, the, the game ended on a, a wildest. I've never seen that play before in my life. But I'll tell you, it shows the alertness and, in, in the, you know, how these guys react uh, and how good they are when they have to think on their feet quickly. And, uh, you know, Trends did a great job of getting the, he knew he had to get the out at the plate and yet have the mindset also to make a throw to first base as he's off balance. So, Good game, game they had, for me. They had to win, yeah. uh, you know. Just to, it, uh, you kind of, you ca that's a something where you can start a rally or start a run, big run, winning a, a, a tough game like that. So hopefully that's what happens. Yeah, the Mets certainly needed that victory, and the way that game ended, I think, uh, in the history of Major League Baseball, that uh, double play two to three. I mean, you could count it on one hand how many times that happened, <laughs> that happened in the history yeah. of the game. So that was pretty exciting to watch, and it made for a much better flight home uh, for the for the Mets for sure. Uh, but your yeah. your vast experience in the game, you of course managed over in Japan uh, with the Oryx Buffaloes of the MPB and with Team China, 2009 World Baseball Classic. Tell us about baseball in these other countries, and would you like to see uh, Major League Baseball expand this effort, taking baseball to places it has not been yet? Well, first of all, I, I know uh, one of my good friends um, is involved in international baseball. His name's Chris Haydock, and he works for the commissioner's office, and he flies all over the world. You know, and I have given clinics all through Europe uh, several times where we, you know, we've been to Germany, I've been to the Czech Republic, I've been, you know, to little spots as they're trying to promote baseball around the world. And I think it's a great, a great idea. It's tough and I'll get into it in a minute. But yeah, my time in Japan, the, the game was very interesting. It's played a little differently than it is here. Uh, they had tremendous respect for one run. So they played it score one run and they played a defense against one run. So uh, very, they're tremendously disciplined players. Uh, but baseball is throughout the country. The same in China is trying to grow it. China is trying to do a better job. They've, you know, they have a sports ministry in China where they'll take these young athletes and, and bring them and they'll test them and then they'll put them in different. I want your soccer going to play soccer. You're going to play. And so I had some guys who, you know, they made it out to become baseball players. So, but they just don't play enough games in China to be able to really 
make that giant step where they do in Taiwan and they, you know, they, in, in some of those other Asian places, you know, those countries they, they, where they play a lot of baseball, baseball's not played a lot in China, soccer still and basketball is still the two biggest sports. But throughout Europe, the hardest part is, you know, that you've got to get baseball in the schools. I mean, I, I gave a clinic in uh, Germany where I worked with the, their 15 year old national team. And I'm telling you, you talk about some athletic players, they've got them. But again, they just, because of the educational system, their day runs long. They, it's tough for them to practice. Uh, I had talked to one high school coach who uh, told me, he said, you know, Mr. Collins, we, he said, we do it the best we can to try to get, you know, play as much baseball as we can. He said, but I only have 12 players on my team in the school because most kids are so, they're either, you know, their soccer, they have soccer so big in Germany, but the school day is so long, it's tough to get out. And, and we don't have a lot of baseball fields to play on. And he said, but, you know, uh, four of my players are girls on my team. So he said, I don't even have enough guys to put up, to put a team together. So the national, the national teams of these countries are, are what's where we've got to start to grow the sport. But, you know, we've got to get little leagues in these countries. We've got to get them playing more. Uh, it's and it's very, very tough. I went, I was in London, uh, gave a, a clinic for five days in London and, you know, and again, they enjoyed it. They had club teams, but they just don't play enough games. And so in order to grow the sport, you've got to get them out and get them to enjoy playing the big game of baseball. Yeah. And certainly invest in those schools and build those fields and get the kids involved at a very early age. Yeah. So uh, uh, thank you for that, Terry. Um, uh, I want to get to the uh, current day New York Mets here. Um, there's still several games under uh, 500. <clears throat> and there has been a recent, uh, several recent moves uh, that the team hopes will shake things up and turn the tide. A couple of recent moves saw the Mets DFA Tomas Nito opting to keep Luis Torrens, who made that great uh, game-ending double play. He's hitting uh, over 300 in his new backup role now that Francisco Alvarez has returned from the IL. And they also released Omar Navarre, Navarre since uh, we last taped. What's your take on these catching moves the Mets have made recently? Well, you know, I, I thought they did a good job. I thought, you know, Navarre, again, being left-handed, left-handed hitting catcher was an ideal backup catcher. He just hasn't hit, and, and that's that's a big thing. And when you when you play and you're a backup guy, when you get in the game, you know, they're not expecting big things, but, you you know, they these are these are guys who, look, you've got to really be able to catch and throw or, you know, come up and be a power kind of guy. Um but, but you know, getting Francisco Alvarez back—that's that's, that's got to be a key. And I'm, you know, he's and again, the energy he brings and how he healed so fast from that injury, from that surgery, is really amazing. So uh, I think that's important. I think Torrens has obviously come on. He, he's got he can catch and throw. So you know, he's he, he's going to be a backup guy, which he's been in the past. So uh, it should be a, a good blend. But you know, one of the keys, and again, it comes down to this game, John is you win and lose when those guys on the mound. You just can't out slug. You just don't can't out slug those great pitchers. When you start getting into the playoffs and stuff, you put set, face such good pitching, you've got to be able to run some pitching out there that keep the other team down too. So that's what uh, it's about, getting that pitching worked out. And uh, hopefully, you know, we get Senga started to come back. But one yeah. of the keys is to get Edwin Diaz in the spot where he starts to save those games because that bridge to him – They've got those guys. They've got those guys who can you can get that seventh and eighth inning and lock it down to where he comes in and finishes the game. So I think getting him back on track is the key. Yeah, and uh, Diaz is coming off the IL, uh, and uh, uh, Carlos Mendoza said he's going right back into the closers role. He had a couple of uh, rehab outings that he did pretty well with down in the minors. Uh, and I'd say, Terry, as you are, he's kind of the most important piece now for turning this team around. Uh, can the Mets even consider contending without Diaz coming back strong? Not saying he'll ever be the guy that he was a couple of years ago, but even close to what he was uh, just uh, just a few years ago. Well, John, I'm going to tell you, again, they've shown their offense is starting to come around a little bit, but I'm going to tell you, with the way pitching is today, the way the starting pitchers, that 75 pitch mark, they're coming out of games, and so you're looking at, five, maybe five plus innings out of a starting pitcher. And you've got three or four, three guy, three key guys in that bullpen. And you've, we've seen recently, they're starting to wear down already. And it's only the, it's only early middle of June. And so, you know, you've got to have somebody 
that's going to save those guys, that you can put them in situations where their matchups are pretty good because you've got that lockdown guy at the end of the game because now they're using those three guys a lot, and, and there's a lot of nights. If you've got the lead at seventh, eighth, and ninth inning, you want to use those guys, and they're using them a lot. So I think it's important that you know they – start to try to push those starting pitchers a little bit more, get a little bit more depth out of them. Uh, so we're, those relievers, you're not asking three and four pitchers every night uh, to be in a game. I was, when I was doing TV last week in New York, there was, I did a study. I did two, two games in a row, and the average in every game, every, including both teams, eight pitchers a night are entering baseball games, and that's a lot of, that's a lot of pitching. Wow, that is that's I don't know how that could be sustainable. Uh, and then your arms get tired, and then everything goes to hell <laughs> if you can't that's have right. the pitchers as that bridge to the closer. Uh, the Mets have also made some news uh, infield development since our last show. They've been sitting uh, Jeff McNeil, who's struggled the past two seasons, and they've been opting to play more games going with Jose Iglesias, who's hitting over four hundred uh, and has a one plus OPS. And with Brett Beatty now back in Triple A, uh, there's a directive that Beatty begin playing some games at second base in the minor leagues. Now that Mark Vientos has kind of taken over the third base job, McNeil is an intense competitor. There's no doubt about that. But is it possible that his benching could be the maybe the beginning of the end for Jeff McNeil in a Mets uniform? Yeah. Well, I can't say it isn't. It's certainly a possibility. I hope it isn't. I, I mean, you know, this guy won a batting title three years ago, and he's a, yeah. a really a good offensive player. You know, and I'll tell you, when you're that intense and you take a lot, and Jeff takes a lot of it on himself. I mean, he pushes himself to the limit, and sometimes you fight yourself when you get you're that intense. I'm a living example of it. You know, because you 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 demand so much of yourself that, you know, sometimes you, you try too hard. And I think just one of the things. So, you know, taking a little time off in the middle of the season, and I know they said, well, you know, he's worked, he's been in the cage working on things. I'm going to tell you something, John. There's a lot of good hitters in that batting cage. It, you know, it's when you get on that field with that guy in that different uniform that's on that mound is when it counts. So, you know, I think they, I, I, they gave him some time off, but they put him back in Sonny's game, and what does he do? He gets two big hits. Yes, and, and then all of a sudden the next day again, he's back on the bench again. And I, I think that's, you know, if he's going to be your guy, you got to, you got to you get him out there and find out if he, if he continues to struggle, okay, make the change. Uh, Iglesias, great backup player. It was a very, very good shortstop when he was younger, very good. He got great hands, great teammate. I, I had him last year when I was doing some stuff with the Marlins really enjoyed being around him. And he's the ideal guy. You need to set Jeff against a tough left-hander. Hey, this guy's faced some of the toughest left-handers in the game for 11 years. So I think that's a great pickup by them. Um, but if, if, you know, Jeff McNeil, you know, this guy was, you know, there was times he, they thought about hitting him third. There were times that he's hit fourth this year, for heaven's sake. So he's a really important offensive part. And the only way to get him going is to get him that lineup, seeing live yeah. pitching. Yeah, there's a lot going on with him. They had him batting ninth last night. He went 0 for 4. So they're moving him all over the place. And like you said, after that two-hit game in uh, in England, maybe he should have been in the lineup the next day to kind of see if he could get some momentum going. But, yeah, that's it. You know, the fans love Jeff, and uh, he's been such a great part of the team and, of course, the batting title a couple of years ago. And it really is kind of sad to see him be, you know, slumping. And you know how emotional he is. So hopefully everything's going to work out with Jeff and he gets a couple of good games under his belt, a few good hits. And that could lead to uh, him coming back to where we're all accustomed to him being. And that is kind of like a 300 hitter. Well, you know, John, one of the things, one of the other factors with Jeff, you know, they've they've kind of put him in second base. Hey, when the, when that team was going great, they, it's because they had Jeff McGill. They could play him anywhere. You know, and so to find a guy to let maybe use Jeff and put him in left field, get you know, give uh, one of the guys a night off, or put or let Vientos have a night off. You want to DH Vientos maybe against the left hander, run Jeff over to third base because that's where his value was so big. And when he was doing that role, he performed. He performed brilliantly. Yeah, he was, and uh, yeah, because he is uh, that utility guy that you know not only is an elite player, but he could play several positions. So that's an asset to any yeah. organization for sure. Um, all right, let's get into some of Mets history, Terry, and looking back at this week in Mets, Mets history from June 8th, 2010, with the 272nd pick in the 2010 MLB draft, the Mets selected a pitcher shortstop named Jacob DeGrom from Stetson University. 
Uh, Terry, what memories do you have of G- of Degrom coming up through the Mets season before reaching the majors in 2014? And do you remember about hearing Jacob deciding to be a full fledged starter rather than competing as a shortstop back then? Well, I, I knew when we signed him when we when I when I was the field coordinator uh, when I first came to the Mets. You know, Jacob Degrom was going to be a pitcher. You know, he's six foot five. Um, great arm. And so shortstop was not even in, in the, in the thought process. They were going to put him on the mound because those scat scouts saw that good live fastball that he had. So he was going to pitch. Well, you know, early he had that, he, had, he got Tommy John. So he sat out a year. And, but when he started to develop, everybody, everybody that I ever talked to in the pitching side in the minor leagues started talking about this guy, command. It always started with command. You know, they had the good arm, but how he commanded his stuff. You know, through strikes with his fastball, he had a back then he had a little curveball and a slider that he threw strikes with. Um, he, and later, as he got closer to the big leagues, he started to develop a changeup that you know was also a pitch he needed to, so that he could again just change speeds a little bit. But when he came up, John, I'm going to tell you, his ability to adjust on the fly was off the charts. And I, I I'm going to give the minor league coaching staff credit for that. A lot of times that is. An inert or an innate uh, talent that everyone, some of these big league players have. But this guy, in his second start, I mean, I brought him and he started against the Yankees and threw fine. But his second start, he started that game. He didn't have his, couldn't find his breaking pitch. It wasn't working. And yet he didn't stop throwing it. He kept using it in certain counts so he could. And all of a sudden, in the fifth inning, he found it and gave me seven innings. That's hard to find a guy that has, has that ability to to continue to pitch and learn and, you know, just weasel his way through the lineup, not giving, not giving in with the fastball, making pitches with it, and still trying to find that feel for that break of all. And, you know, that's hard to find. And, and that's why I thought at that point, I said, this guy is going to be really, really good. And, of course, he certainly has been really, really good. What a great pitcher uh, uh, Jacob deGrom is. And uh, he's coming back soon from this injury, so let's hope that he uh, – picks up where he left off and one of those elite players. Uh, finally, Terry, June 10th. Uh, this is 2003, one day before his 20th birthday. Jose Reyes made his debut for the Mets against the Texas Rangers in Arlington. The 19-year-old went two for four, two runs scored in that game. Uh, Terry, talk about managing Jose first in 2011, the year he won that batting title, and then later when he returned to the Mets in 2016 and 2017. Well, first of all, he's one of my favorite people to be around. Have you ever seen Jose where he didn't have a smile on his face? He absolutely loved to be at the ballpark. He loved to be on the field. He loved to play. Tremendous talent. I mean, one of the greatest throwing arms from shortstop with that funny delivery that he had that I've ever seen. Lightning fast. Power from both sides. I mean, even though he basically was more of a singles and doubles guy, but he could could hit him out of the ballpark if he wanted to. And I'll tell you, his energy was off the charts. In 2011, when he won that batting title, I have not seen anybody. I actually, a couple of guys, uh, Jeff Bagwell, the one year, but this guy, every game had great at bats every night. He just didn't give away at bats. And, and I, that's why, you know, he kept his average where it was. And, you know, when he, he again, he was so hard in defense because he could drop a bunt down on you in a second. So when he would come up, infielders had to come play in a little bit because of his foot speed. In the fact, so now all of a sudden their range has been shortened because they've had to move closer to the hitter, and he played games with certain guys. But fun to be around, and when we got him back later in in my tenure there, when he showed back up, I was in the locker room talking with David Wright when he walked in, and these two guys had the biggest smiles on their face. They were back together. They were, you know, those those two guys were brothers, and uh, and again his energy. It, the way he handled it and his ability to help some of the younger players, you know, Ahmed Rosario was a protege of Jose's and, you know, his, his rise in the big leagues, he, he owes to the fact that Jose Reyes was in his corner. So uh, one of the most fun guys I've ever had on my team. And uh, I'll tell you what, John, I'll bet you tomorrow, if we saw Jose Reyes, he'd look like he could still play and he probably can still play. He keeps himself in tremendous shape. And, and I just, uh, I was a pleasure to be around him. Yeah, one of the most exciting things for me watching Met games uh, back in the day with Jose was when he hit one in the gap and he started circling those bases. Uh, that energy and that speed and just 
it was just incredible to watch him rounding for a second, going a yeah. third, and uh, no one like it. Yeah, one of my favorites of all time as well, Jose Reyes. Uh, you can check out Mets history every day by going to at New York M History on X. And now it's going to be time for our special Talking with TC. And now it's time for Talking with TC. He is the radio voice of the New York Mets and has been calling Mets games since 1995. His signature, put it in the books, is a phrase that brings joy to all Mets fans. He has called play-by-play for both the New York Rangers and New York Islanders in his illustrious career. A New Yorker through and through, he has emceed many magical events in Mets history on the field and has hosted the opening day ceremonies at Shea Stadium and now City Field since 2004. He's an authority on Mets history. In 2012, he was inducted into the National Jewish Hall of Fame. He's a member of the New York Baseball Hall of Fame. And in 2023, he was inducted into the New York Mets Hall of Fame. It's our pleasure to bring on the one and only Howie Rose. Howie, welcome to the show. Thank you. That's a wonderful introduction. And all it proves is that I'm old. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we we all are, Howie. Yeah, we all are. That's all. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Good to see you. Well, I, I'm just I want to start out by just thank you for coming on. Obviously, you know, we've become great oh, friends. And sure. you know, I don't know, John. Did you know I that Howie and I worked together? We actually I did some games with him last couple years. Was it last year, Howie? Last couple of years? Two years ago. Yeah. And Two it years was ago. fabulous. Yeah. How was yep. that experience? Well, yeah, we were Oh, we had a we had a great time. I mean, I tell you what, I learned one thing, John, and that is how difficult that job really is. I mean, he is peppered with uh, commercials that he has to read in the middle of he's, he's doing the game, and all of a sudden they slide a, a commercial in front of him <laughs> that he's got to read, and and then now, hey, how how about all the times that that you know I, I want to add something, and they tell you before, hey, look, you know, let how he let him let let him finish the action. And I start to say something, and now he's got to read a commercial. And I'm thinking, yeah. how, how do you do this job? My God. It keeps um, us in business. It's about the best of it. <laughs> you know, that it's like a, it's like a, every, almost every play now is sponsored by someone. Every strikeout, the first pitch, this and that. Isn't that really distracting? It is. You get used to it. It's just the reality of broadcasting baseball in the 21st century because the bills have to be paid, you know. But but one of the great things about having Terry with me for however many games it was, was that we could revert to what to me. And I hope, Terry, it kind of reminded you, too, of when you were growing up and listening to baseball on the radio, because we weren't pounding anybody with statistics and all of the information that we have access to today. It can make your ears bleed if you use too much of it. And so to have Terry in the booth and be able to go back and forth, exchanging stories and anecdotes, I I mean, I, I enjoyed it just as a listener, never mind as a guy doing the broadcast, because, you know, you bring 50 the odd years of experience from TC into the booth. And, and we didn't have to rely on things that would go through most people's ears anyway. Yeah. You know how I agree. Cause that's, I mean, I grew up obviously I, I was in a small town in Michigan. I mean, we listened, I listened to the tiger games and I listened to the Milwaukee Braves games. Cause that's all we could get because there was, there was the game of the week was the only game you could watch on TV. So the radio guy, he had he had to paint the picture. And, you know, and so you talked about the action and what's going on in the field. And I'm not sure, of course, today numbers, you know, they say a lot. But, you know, I'm not sure the fans can relate to numbers as opposed to relating to the action when you're calling it. Absolutely. And, and that's why I think we as broadcasters have to be so careful of about what specific information we disseminate because we're not trying to show off or anything. We have all these Uh, various press notes and different websites that give us information that's definitely germane to the game in some situations, but you could drown in those, in those waters. And as I've gotten along in my career, I've realized that most people, most people, I'm not talking about the hardcore baseball fans, but I'm talking about most people who are just interested in hearing what's happening on the field and having a vivid portrait portrayed of what's happening on the field. Those people are turned off by too many numbers and too many statistics. So you have to be really careful about how you weave them in. 
Yeah, I agree. Holly, all the years you've met or been, been announcing, tell me the most fun year you had announcing the Mets. Well, I got to tell you, 2015 was right there. But as you know, you know, 2015 was a great, what, last three months, right? I remember right. in, in late July, and then you'll remember this, I'm sure, Clayton Kershaw went through the Mets at City Field one night like a, a knife just going through butter. I mean, I said we're shut out in about two hours. And, you know, the roster was different. You had, I think, Eric Campbell batting cleanup or something like that. And, it, you know, it was not an imposing lineup. It just wasn't. It's, it's, it's what you were given. But then I looked at that as kind of rock bottom. Then things started to change. The trade deadline came. Obviously, center, the centerpiece of that was Joanna Cespedes. But obviously, you know, Kelly Johnson and, and Uribe and Conforto being brought up and, you know, everything else totally changed the, the, the look and the structure of that roster to the point where we went on the most enjoyable two or three month ride that I ever had in baseball, um, just about from the trade deadline on. It, it was fabulous. And I, I, I'm sure you enjoyed it as, as much as we did because it got you into the World Series. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it's, it was a magical season for sure. And, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, we're going to have some people on who are a lot of responsible for the forming of that team, putting it together. Because I'll tell you, you know, you, you know when I got the job in New York, I wasn't sure, you know, the direction they were going to go. Because I remember the first year, you know, in 2011, we were going to make some changes. You know, we traded Beltron and, and they were trying to build up the farm system, build up the younger players and, and so we were kind of riding that, hey, look, let's, we're going to build and build. And all of a sudden, you know, they say he made some moves and boy, it changed the entire makeup of the club. And, and it, it was just a blast every day to go out there. And, you know, and, you know, one of the things I don't think the fans realize, Holly, is the time before the broadcast that you put together all of what you want to talk about during that broadcast, as far as, you know, pitchers, a pitcher on the other team, you have a story about him that you find out about, or some guys on, on the Mets, you, you, you come up with, with some, and I, I find out, how do you get all that information? I mean, where does it come from? Well, I'll tell you part of it, and it, it's not, stat but, you know, I know I've thanked you for this in person before, so I'm, I'm happy to say it in a more public setting, but I have covered every Mets manager going back to Joe Frazier in the mid-1970s, and never were we as broadcasters given the access that you gave us just to keep us informed on who might have been down in the bullpen that night or who might have had some sort of injury that might compromise his performance that night. But what you did in enabling us to have the broadest scope of understanding what that roster looked like on that night not only enabled us to do a more responsible job of broadcasting the game because we knew who might or might not be available. But, you know, I have to tell people that Terry was smart enough to understand that it gave us the opportunity to have the managers back because it's easy to second guess a manager when you don't have all the information, but when you're patient and a fan might say, well, why is he not using so-and-so here? Or why is he hitting this guy instead of that guy? We knew that. And, and Terry, you came to trust us pretty quickly. And I remember I think your first year, maybe your first month, first month, I said, Terry, let me ask you something off the record. And you said, BS, nothing ever ends up off the record. <laughs> but, you know, we, right. But we had to prove our, our loyalty, if you will, to you. And you returned that in kind. And I think that made our broadcast better. And hopefully we brought the fans a little closer to you and, and how you thought and how you ran a game. Well, you know, Holly, I, I really thought, obviously, you know, we really upset some of the media, some of the written media guys who didn't stay in before the game. John, we, you know, I had this, we have this press thing. And then I used to let, let Holly and the, the announcer stay in because my thought process was this. Hey, look, they are Mets. They travel with us. They're in the locker room. They're with us all the time. You know, they need to know some stuff. You know, it's, you know, I, I don't worry about the other guys who are, you know, that work for different people. You know, these guys are part of the team. And I always thought, gosh, it, it'd be nice. It might help their broadcast if they actually know what's going on. Because why second, you know, why guess? Hey, do you think he's going to use this guy tonight when, hey, look, if he's not, they don't even have to bring it up. And you can they can just do the game. So I thought it worked out great. And, you know, and you guys, and again, how as I sat there in that room, 
you know, some of the questions that you guys would ask me, you know, sometimes I wasn't thinking, wow, I, I'm not really sure I got an answer to some of those questions. But, you know, and it goes to the fact that, you know, I was so taken back when I got to work with you about the work that goes into getting ready to announce a game and then the process of doing the game itself. Man, I, you know, I used to think you guys would go up there and sit down and, and the game starts, you open your book, you keep track of who's, who strikes out, who gets hits, and then moved on. And I found out that is so far from, you know, so far from what goes on. So I really applaud the job you guys do. It's, it's incredible. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. And you know hey, what? I, After all these years, it's still fun. Yeah. You know how I got to tell you, one of the toughest things I've ever seen you do, ever, was announce – the roster of the Mets this year on opening day. <laughs> Have you ever had one? <laughs> the sous chef. <laughs> sous chef. You named them all. I didn't know. I didn't know if we we're going to get the game started. Was that like Neither the toughest, the, you, the toughest introductions you've ever had? You know what? It wasn't so much tough doing the introductions as it was to keep from laughing because, you know, I'm introducing people that never introduced before a game and, you know, they've got roles that the fans have no idea even exist. And depending on the weather, some of those fans are pretty cold and uncomfortable and you want to kind of get through it. I know, but, and I, I only say the sous chef because people love to chew. <laughs> chef hands down of all of those people that were introduced, got the best ovation. And so when I introduced whatever the chef's name was and the crowd erupted, I had to keep from laughing. I mean, it, I, I, and I mean, there's so, and there's so many extra people now, <laughs> my God, I, yeah. you know, I, 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 when you, when it started, I'm watching the game and I'm thinking, now why would those guys be out there? So <laughs> I'm sure when you got that, that said, Hey, here's who you're going to introduce today. You, you had to be going, what? Well, <laughs> who you are know what? All these guys. It started last year, which was interesting to me because when Buck Showalter was managing last year, he told us after the fact that he endorsed that because he thought for people who were largely anonymous within the organization, that it was great for them and great for their families to be recognized publicly for all of the five seconds that it took to introduce them. Well, yeah, it's five seconds times another 20 people or whatever it is, but I got was coming from. I thought that was his idea. And then when I got the script this year, I said, oh, we're doing this again, new manager and everything. So I'm not sure if it was Carlos necessarily who, who wanted to do it or if that came from higher up, but it, it, it was kind of fun, I admit. Yeah. So who had, in, when you were first, you know, deciding you want to get into announcing, who, do you, who did you listen to who made the biggest impact? Well, my very, very, very first baseball broadcasting influence, and again, this shows you how old I am now, was Mel Allen, who was uh, oh, wow. doing the Yankees. Um, I, I fell in love with baseball in, in 1961, the year the Mets were born. And I was a seven-year-old. We lived in the Bronx. My dad was a huge Yankee fan. And imagine this, Terry. Imagine being an impressionable young baseball fan who was enamored with everything about the game and of it sitting next to your dad at Yankee stadium, watching Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris in that legendary home run duel in 1961. And then the next year the Mets are created. And I thought, well, geez, this team was made just for me now because I'm a new baseball fan, you know, but it was Mel Allen's voice that absolutely got through to every fiber of my being. Um, but a little bit later on, as I, as I thought, even as a teenager, about pursuing broadcasting, Marv Albert was the one who really was, and still is to this day, uh, my biggest influence, my mentor. I fell in love with hockey and the Rangers, listening to Marv on radio. And you talk about a guy who knew how to do a game on radio between hockey and basketball. There's never been anybody better. So really, Mel Allen and Marv Albert were my two biggest, earliest influences. Yeah. So how you? So you did hockey. How hard is it to broadcast a hockey game with the as fast as that game? You know, is? I, I. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because most people feel that it's got to be very, very difficult, if not the hardest to do of all of the sports. I would maintain though that once you get control of the flow of the game. You know, hockey's so fast that, you know, if you're not right on top of it, it's going to, you'll drown. 
So, you know, you've got to be able to control the flow, edit the action a little bit, especially on radio. You don't have the time really to describe every single pass because a lot of it is irrelevant to the action itself. And, and once you learn to do that, the hardest part is just identifying the players because what's happened over the years is that all of the buildings are new now and the broadcast locations are way up here and worse yet, way back there. So you're straining to see who's who. It's not hard to do the game. Whoa. But the hardest part is just identifying the guys because now they all wear, wear helmets. They didn't when I started. And and the broadcast locations are just not conducive to doing a crisp game. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be. With all the line changes, I mean, there's so much, you know, in yeah. people in and out all the time. I, You know, I, I, I did play hockey growing up, but I – I enjoy going to the games, but man, I'll tell you what, even as a fan, it's tough to keep track of who's who. And, you know, and it's, I can just imagine trying to announce a game like that. That's, that's why I, at least I know in baseball, when there's a, you know, a, a change being made, somebody's got to tell the umpire. And so there's a little bit of a delay oh, in the yeah. game where you can know who's coming in the game and who isn't. So. Well, you see, that's, that's what, a, it's interesting you say that Terry, because to me, that's what makes baseball, particularly on radio, the most challenging sport to do, because as opposed to hockey, you have all of that extra time and you've got to learn how to weave stories or notes in and out without uh, really clubbing the listener on the head with too much in numbers. But, you know, once you get the grasp of that and again, you can control the flow. Those are the biggest words, I think, for a broadcaster who's learning any sport. You have to learn to control the flow. Once you do that, those two sports are so satisfying because they're so different. They're polar opposites, and I love them both. Yeah, you know, it's you know, I've always been amazed when you know I listen when I listen or watch a game. You know, and it's a bad game. You know, the the home team or whoever the obviously the team you're you're you know announcing for, they're having a bad night. It's I mean, how hard is it to keep that flow going when? You know, it like it's eleven to one, and there's no action, and there, you know, all of a sudden the big the stars come out, and I mean, is, that's got to be you've got to be able to reach into your bin of stories and come up with something that yeah. entertains these guys, a the fan when they're listening. Well, you just hit on the key word, which is entertain, because you know that a lot of listeners have tuned out, if it, but you also know that the ones who have hung in. Or for whatever reason, the diehards, maybe they're expecting a huge comeback, but they're also expecting to be, as you said, entertained. And so a lot of times where you would think that announce, an announcer kind of loses a little bit of, of that adrenaline and starts to crawl to the finish line. For me, it's actually the opposite. OK, this game's out of hand. Now I've really got to step it up and I've got to find a way to keep that audience hold uh, held. And a lot of times you need to have a real good partner who's willing to go anywhere with you. And believe me, we have veered a long way off course from time to time. But the stuff that's funny, you know, the stuff that people remember isn't necessarily the crispness or accuracy of a particular call. It's that story or anecdote that you might have told when a game is out of hand that they got a kick out of. And so I love that challenge. I don't love when when a game is one sided, but I do embrace the challenge of and listenable and even entertaining. How oh, did you always have a partner? Was there always two of you when you when you started? Yeah, yeah. I, I've always thought it's funny to say that because obviously you knew the greatest of them all, Vin Scully, from your days in the Dodgers organization, and Vin largely worked alone. Uh, there have been times when I have for a few innings at a clip for any number of reasons, and I've always thought it would be enjoyable as a challenge at least I used to think it would, to do a game innings one through nine without having a partner just to see if I could do it and how it would turn out. I would think it would be an easier thing to do now since they put the pitch clock in and move the game along a little bit. I can't even imagine having to have done that up until the year before last because the game had gotten so out of control in terms of how spread out everything became. I think in a lot of ways what's happened the last two years with the rules changes, even though a lot not have embraced them is they've made the game a better product and so under those circumstances yeah it'd be fun i don't i don't know that i'm as up for the challenge now at age 70 as i would have been at age 40 or 50 but hey, i'm game if it ever happens so how many years do you think you want to go how many too longer 
I, you know, I'm going to sound like a player here now, but I, I go year by year at this point. You know, we get to the finish line. I take a month to decompress. I kill every remaining worm in South Florida with my ridiculously bad golf prowess, <laughs> ground ball. I mean, Terry, it's just you can't start playing this game at my age and think you have a chance. But for some stupid reason, it's fun. So once I get about a month of that under my belt, um, then I kind of take a deep breath because by that point, I'm decompressed. I talk it over with my wife and I say, OK, do we have another year in us? And if, if we come to the answer is yes, then I go on. And, and that's where acted through next year and and my mindset is do this year and one more and then see where we're at well uh, i'll tell you, you certainly hope you're around a long long time i got i have a friend down here that here in port st lucy who is i play a lot of golf with and you know and he's friends with ron darling because ron's a member of the yep. club on down here also and he told me oh gosh it's probably been two years now and he's a huge Mets fan. He, you know, he's got the MLB thing, and but he actually turns off uh, Keith and and those guys, and turns Howie Rose on and listens <laughs> to the radio broadcast as he watches the game. And I think that's a tremendous compliment to the job you've done. Well, I appreciate that. I hope he's able to sync it up with the play-by-play -play because <laughs> of the delay that you get. Although nowadays, now now that everything is legalized as far as gambling, if you do that, if you just listen to the radio, you might hear what's happening ahead of what you see on bed in, you know, before the play is completed. I, I didn't think of that. Television, yeah. so. I, I may have to bring that up really the next, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, at the know. next 19th just, hole meeting. I'll have to bring that up. So, John, you, oh, I know you've got some questions for Holly. Oh, absolutely. And just to follow up with what you were just talking about, I've done that myself, is to uh, try to sync up that radio broadcast while watching it on TV so I could hear you. And it's not easy to get that perfect so know. You, know, you know it's matched up. But uh, There is a way to do it, though. If you delay the DVR, mm -hmm. you know, you put the DVR on pause, and then you can sync it up with the play-by-play -play on radio. Fast forward ahead to where I'm at. That's how you can catch up. But no, I'll give tricks it a, of the trade. Maybe I'll give it another shot tonight. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> uh, Problem is, then we're exposed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I tell you. Um, you know, I just enjoy it so much. And 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 Howie, I mean, your career. You've called so many uh, great moments in Mets history. Uh, one of your most legendary calls took place June first. Uh, 2012, when Johan Santana threw that first no-hitter in Mets history. Of course, that was a very emotional night for the franchise. It was a very emotional night for Terry. Um, tell us about that night as the anticip anticipation built throughout the game, both as a broadcaster and, was, and also a fan. And do, yeah. you ever, do you ever think the Mets would throw a no-hitter in your lifetime? No, no. That's the beauty of what happened that night. You know, for one thing, as TC remembers – and I remember saying this around the fifth inning because Johan had been on a pitch count that Terry was pretty adamant about before the game at, I think it was a 110 to 115, right? If I'm not right. mistaken, because he was a coming off of a surgically repaired shoulder and B had pitched a complete game in his previous start. Obviously they were going to be careful. Walked about four guys in the first four innings. And I remember saying on the air, if you think tonight's the night, forget it, because with the pitch count, what it is, it's just it's not going to work. And, and then I found myself doing something. I'm almost embarrassed to have done it because I always prided myself on being a reporter in the booth. And if a guy had a no hitter going, just say he's got a no hitter going, because I grew up watching Tom Seaver and I went through all of those superstitions as a kid. And, you know, Tom, I think, lost three no hitters in the ninth inning. So I just had come to a point where I thought it had been fated for whatever reason that no Met was ever going to pitch a no hitter. And so I don't know why, but along the way, I found myself not using the phrase no hitter. I said the Mets have all the runs and all the hits or whatever I had to do to let the listener know that a no hitter was in progress. But I felt a little dirty because I never used the phrase no hitter. But that was the fan in me beginning to the later innings. And Terry, I don't know if you remember this, but you know, my on-air partner that night was Jim Duquette because Josh Lewin, who was my regular partner, was off. His daughter was graduating, I think, high school. And so Duke filled in. And we get to the ninth inning now, 
And Jim, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Broadcast News with Albert Brooks, but there's a scene in that movie where he is so nervous right. that sweat is pouring off of him to where there's a puddle <laughs> underneath him. That's how our booth looked under Jim Duquette's seat. He refused to say a word in the ninth inning because he was so nervous, whether superstitiously or just that he wouldn't find the right words and give me enough time to get back in. But I was as nervous going into that ninth inning as I've been, I think, broadcasting anything I've ever done. And interestingly, that ninth inning went pretty quickly because, let me see, I think it was Matt Holliday was the first guy, and he went after one of the first pitches and hit mm -hmm. a fly ball to pretty shot. I think it was Andres Torres made the catch. That's one out. Next hitter was Alan Craig, if I'm not mistaken. And he lined out pretty hard to left, but Kirk Newenheis had a relatively easy play. So pretty quickly, there were two out, nobody on. And I'm telling you, my stomach is doing flips because not only am I nervous as the fan in me was hoping uh, to see this thing get to the finish line. Now as a broadcaster, I'm telling myself, don't mess this up. Don't try to get cute. Don't try to be poetic or too prosaic. Just Watch what happens on the field and report it. So what happens? With all of those pitches he's thrown, knowing what's going on in Terry's mind, this has to be killing him because it was pretty evident that Johan was not going to give him the ball. So this was all Johan here. And naturally, he gets to 3-2. and two. He falls behind 3-0, and oh, right? I think yeah. he fell behind 3-0, oh, comes back to 3-2 <laughs> on, on a and who do you think is on deck waiting to spoil the party if it came to it? But Yadier Stinkin' Molina, who, of course, ruined the Mets' bid for a pennant in 2006. It was going to have to come down to Molina, right? But Johan throws that change up, free swings and misses, strike three, it's over. And in my mind, in my heart, I have to go one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Did this actually happen? The ball's in Josh Tolley's glove. And now I'm saying whatever I'm saying. And, you know, again, you become a reporter at that point. But that was really as emotional a call as I've ever made, just as I know it was as emotional a night for you, Terry, as you've ever managed, right? No, oh, without a question. I, yeah, I mean, I, well, all the things you said is exactly, you know, went ran, ran through my mind. It was like, it's probably not up the sixth inning. I'm thinking, you know, how, how is this going to happen? It, it, you know, this guy has got to give up a hit. Otherwise, you know, the, the pitch count is going to build and, and this is not going to be good. And, uh, and, and I will tell you, you know, obviously in the seventh inning, I went down and said something to him and, you know, and I didn't pull the, you know, don't bring up the no hitter. He, we, he know, he knew what was going on. And I walked down and, and I just said, how you doing? And he looked me in the eye and he said, skip, I'm going to be fine. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. And, I just said, you're my hero, big boy. Go get him. And sure enough, he finished it. Yeah, that was a that was a really an electric night. You know, I'm not sure if I ever asked you this, but if I remember right, the score was six to nothing. I mean, you guys kind of pulled away. And I know you knew what it meant to the franchise, but you're also always so protective of your players and thinking of them first. When it got around the seventh or eighth inning, were you quietly hoping that they'd scratch out a hit so this would become a much easier decision? Without <laughs> question. Without a question, but you know, I will tell you, he's. This is why I love him. I'm going to tell you, he and he was great after the game. You know, he came in my office and and thanked me for leaving him in. And he said, "I know you could have taken me out." He said, "I wasn't going to come out, but I know you were, you might have tried." But it, he and I respected him to this day because you know he was legitimately uh, thankful that you know he got the got that opportunity. So it was quite a night nice, for sure. You know something? I'm not sure I ever told you this. But I did something after that game I've never done. I mean, this was such a, a special moment and a, and a unique one in Mets history. By the time I got downstairs after the game, because we did an extended post-game show, must have been 45 minutes to an hour after the last pitch. But I wanted to get down to the clubhouse just not only to shake Johan's hand. I was hoping he'd still be there. But I actually asked him to sign my scorecard, which oh, I had never seen. done before and I haven't done since. And I think... To this day, that scorecard is sitting in the Mets Hall of Fame and Museum on display. Oh, it was such a, no it was such a momentous, yeah, it was such a momentous yeah. night in Mets history, and it meant so much to me to have, yeah. you know, been. So to have him sign that is something that will, for me, last forever. Wow. Yeah, I still got my tickets from that night. Uh, actually, uh, had quite a bit of Mets memorabilia. Uh, I was unloading some stuff. Asked my nephew. 
you know, what would you like? Would you like my seats from from Shea Stadium uh, that I have? He said, Uncle, I just want the two tickets from the <laughs> Johan Santana no hitter. So gave those to him. And uh, yeah, that was such a magical night. But uh, how you've had a lot of magical nights uh, behind the mic. And <clears throat> do you have a personal, most memorable call for me? Personally, it's the Piazza home run in uh, yeah. 2001. I mean, I kind of separate that from the pack because that wasn't as much to me uh, about baseball as it was Americana. You know, that was a moment to me of national significance because we in New York were the worst. And the wound was still very fresh. It was only 10 days after 9 11. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I would have been fine if they canceled the season on the morning of September 12th. It, it was so stunning that we were victimized that way that I couldn't wrap my arms around the thought, not so much of doing a baseball game for the next little while, but driving to the ballpark 10 days later was nerve wracking because this was the first time we were going to assemble in those numbers. I think there were about 45,000 people at Shea Stadium that night, and we didn't know what to expect because of what had just happened. So when Mike hit that home run, you know, the message was sent metaphorically, never mind what it did to bring the Mets back to win that game, but the message was that even though it was for a fleeting second, and as I say, the wound was still very fresh, we were going to be okay because we could still revel in the baseball game. And that's why I call it Americana. But to me, the other, the other call, because it's the closest I think I ever came to crying on the air, was when Jerry's Familia struck out Dexter Fowler to clinch the pennant in Chicago in 2015. You know, I grew up playing stickball and punch ball and baseball in New York. And sometimes when we're really young and we make believe we're playing for a team, it was for me always the Mets. And I knew even then I wanted to be a broadcaster. So there were a lot of times in the schoolyard, I might have won a game where I'd say, and the Mets win the pennant. But I could only dream that those words would come out of my mouth in real time, as they did in Chicago that October night in 2015. And as I said, not only the Mets win the pennant, but as I was kind of tying it all together and saying that they're in the World Series, if you listen very, very carefully, you could hear my voice a little bit. It was that emotional. And then Terry, the next day, you almost brought me to tears again. Because we're on the bus. You'll remember this, I'm sure. We're on the bus. We stayed over in Chicago. And now we're on the bus getting ready to go to the airport to fly back to New York. And I'll never forget this. TC gets up in front of the bus and he goes, I just want to make sure everybody's on the right bus here because this bus is going to the World Series. And I know you <laughs> teared up a little bit and my eyes welled up a little bit because it was that realization that not only is that where the Mets were headed, but to be, at least in my case, even on the widest periphery, just a little part of that, it could be overwhelming at times. And and so, you know, those moments to me, those are forever. Yeah, they are. Uh, what great memories. Uh, I got one more and I'll turn it back over to Terry. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, you've been uh, had the honor of being the master of ceremonies for so many great moments on the field. Uh, paying honor and tribute to uh, uh, players with their numbers retired. Uh, is there any um, one that stands out above the others for you that you knew that this was such a magical moment you were proud to be emceeing that event? Yeah, but it's not going to be for the reason you would expect. Um, usually when I've been set up for, or had at least at that point been set up for those certain ceremonies, my podium or microphone was always near home plate. But in 2006, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the 1986 world champions. And they set the podium up right around second base. Now, I am one of the world's biggest Beatles fans. I was a little bit too young to get to their concerts at Shea Stadium in 65 and 66. But second base is where they set the Beatles stage up. So when I got to that vantage point and I'm standing out there, I don't know these great players and, you know, a lot of them have become friends over the years. All I could think of was <laughs> this is the exact vantage point that the Beatles had. This is what they saw. This is where they stood. 
to me, that was more overwhelming than anything that I did baseball related that night. Yeah, I have to tell you, and I, you know, I was at the Beatles at Shea, uh, oh. 66. And um, uh, as uh, I told Terry before and another guest that was on a few weeks ago, uh, Andy Martino, who is another huge, yeah. big, big Beatles fan. Uh, he asked, well, where, you, where were you sitting? And I, I was – my dad got us tickets. We were on uh, the Mets uh, dugout about four rows up. So we were close. To oh, the you were close. It was very close. And, and really that was life-changing for me because uh, that was the second time I was at Shea Stadium. The first was July 3rd, 1966. Uh, and that was my very first baseball game, doubleheader against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Eddie Cranepool gets three hits and became my hero for life. Uh, but, uh, you know, a month later, I'm back at Shea, this time to see the Beatles. Uh, so I can understand what you're saying. I mean, you being in second base for that ceremony, but thinking about, wow, this is where the Beatles set up. That's that's a very cool story. Yeah. And you know what? I'll never forget that um... – I guess this would have been around November of 1980. This is long before I'd met my wife. I'm having dinner in the city. I don't know if Terry knew this restaurant. My old favorite restaurant in Manhattan, Mike Minucci's. Does that sound familiar? It's been gone know. since the early 80s. Okay, but anyway, I'm, I'm sitting in Mike Minucci's with a date. I think it was a first date. And she's asking me, and you know, who, who have you enjoyed interviewing or, or meeting among all the players you've known? And I said, you know what? You could take every athlete that I've ever met ever will meet or would ever want to meet, put them all in one room by himself in the room next door. And that's the room I'm going into. It was right after he released Double Fantasy. He was back. Everything yeah. was great. And then less than a month later, he was gone. Yeah. I'll never forget that. And I mean that, too, about how badly I would love to have met him. Yeah, the same here. I mean, uh, that was kind of my bucket list to meet McCartney or any one of the Beatles. And yeah, uh, just like my obsession on music is the Beatles. I listen to them almost every day. Uh, are there any special events you'd like to see in the future at City Field? Anyone you'd like to see honored? Anything special? For me personally, I'd love to see them retire number seven, Freddie Cranepool. I don't know if that'll ever happen. But you personally, what would you like to see the Mets do in the future to honor something? Well, Somebody or something? you know what? I've just got one thing left on my broadcasting bucket list, and that's if you thought it was emotional for me to be able to call a pennant winner and the last out of a pennant clincher for the Mets, that's what I'm holding on for, to have the words, the Mets are the world champions. I don't know how much longer I could hang on, yeah. you know? But at the same time, that's the only thing for me that, that's left. And I, I, I pray somehow that happens. Terry? So, Howie, you know, one of the things that a lot of people ask me, they, you know, I'll meet somebody and they'll want me to, or I'll get a call or a, not a call, but a letter about, you know, hey, I want to, I want to become, I want to get into baseball. How, you know, how can I become a, a manager in baseball? I'm a player, blah, blah, blah. I'm in high school, but what's the road? So how many, you know, I'm sure you've had the same question asked you. So what advice would you give a fan who's going to watch this podcast? who is dying in the, in the future to try to be a, broad, a sports broadcaster, what route uh, would they have to take? Well, the first thing I always say, and I'm assuming these are young enough people who are in either high school or college, and they've right. got time to make a full all-out pursuit. I tell them is be aware that you want to be a broadcaster. And what I mean by that is make the adjustments that you need to start thinking like an announcer. I tell them, you've got to learn to speak. You've got to learn to read. You've got to learn to write properly. And I tell them the best way to learn to speak is to listen. The best way to learn to write is to read because you're going to need those qualities. And it's fine to imitate somebody at first, not just emulate, but imitate because you're going to need a while before you get comfortable with the sound of your own voice. And if it means that you're leaning on broadcasters that you listen to, to compare yourself to or adopt similarities stylistically, go for it. And then when you get to the point where it's time for college, go to a school. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be Syracuse. It doesn't have to be Northwestern or any of these big schools. Go to a school that has a TV station, a radio station, and go for radio before television. 
because you learn to speak when you pursue radio and then you transition to TV as I did years ago. But go to a school that has TV station, a radio station and a newspaper and get involved with all of it. But but think like a broadcaster and create a mindset that will enable you to pay attention to diction and grammar and everything that you'll need to become an announcer down the road and be all out in your pursuit. Because if you don't want it as badly as any major league baseball player wants to ascend to that level, you're going to be passed by by somebody else. So the same work ethic that a player has to exhibit on his way up through the minor leagues, no matter how much natural talent he's got, is the same commitment and work ethic that you've got to display as an aspiring broadcaster. And then just go for it and don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do it. You know, Howie, I know you probably, you know, you don't get it because you're broadcasting games, but is there any new announcers around the league that you say, boy, this guy's really going to be good one of these days? Uh, oh, I, I, well, he's good now. I mean, I love Jason Benetti, who just went from the Cubs to the – from the uh, White Sox to the Tigers. Um, yeah, I mean, he's got everything. He's got the ability and the knowledge to not only watch and interpret a game, but he is so great at engaging with his partner, um, but he's already ascended to network level. And then there were younger broadcasters like Steven Nelson out in L.A. And, um, you know, my partner here with the Mets now, Keith Rad. I mean, we took him out of out of A-ball. He was working with the Brooklyn Cyclones. And to see the, prog- the progress that he's made in a year and a half, it's stunning. He's going to be a fabulous broadcaster. Um, and, and I love, and I know you've very with players, and, and, and managers and coaches, I'm sure. But, you know, there were so many people who I look at over the years who mentored me and gave of their time. And, and Marv Albert's right at the, Albert is right at the top of that list. Um, I just, I embrace the role that I have now, which is to pay it forward. And, um, and I love when I see a young broadcaster that I've even spent five minutes with uh, moving on to the next level or just getting better. It's so rewarding. And I'm sure, Terry, you feel the same way as a manager and a right. coach and, and one who's, who's brought young players along. I mean, you, you, your history has been in player development. There must be so many guys that have made you proud. So, so Howie, do you ever think about leaving? Do you ever think about, you know, the job open someplace else? And you say, boy, I would have really liked to have had that job. The only thing I say, not, not now. I mean, I, you know, again, yeah. I'm 70 years old now, but, but, you know, back when I was I used to dream of working in Southern California, I, as, as a New Yorker, whenever I got out there, I just I was in love with L.A. and San Diego. And um, I, I just would always dream that someday maybe I'd get a job out there. But then, you know, think of how fortunate I've been. I mean, there are two teams that as a fan, as a kid, dictated my moods. And they were the Mets and the Rangers. And I got to work for both of them. So, you know, at a certain point in my career, I, you know, I, I wasn't going anywhere as far as geographically. And um, and so now, you know, it's just about, you know, how long I want to keep going. And, and again, I'm the hired help. They could say to me tomorrow, you're done. And I'd say, OK, thanks a lot. I'll see you in Florida. <laughs> but but back then, you know, back then it was, yeah, I'd love to work in L.A. Wow. So, John, let's get some questions from some fans for Howie. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I got one last question for you, Howie, uh, uh, and then we'll go to the questions for the fans. Uh, I want to talk about your Hall of Fame induction last year, how special that was alongside Gary Cohen, Hojo, Al Leiter. Uh, as a student at the Cardoso High School in Bayside, do you ever imagine you'd be a member of the Mets Hall of Fame? Oh, my goodness. Not even close. Uh, I'll tell you, though, what, what was most stunning to me was not just that day, but it was the aftermath. Because, you know, you get so caught up in the festivities and your speech and you know everything else that goes on that day. It's a whirlwind. But I'll tell you what really hit me when you, you consider what it means to me. There's a, a logo painted on the wall right outside the Mets clubhouse. And last year, say two or three weeks after the induction ceremony, I just happened to be walking that way. And I looked at that logo and then I had this, it was kind of an epiphany. It just dawned on me. I said, you know, all those years that I've worked in, I look at that logo and 
I've always recognized what a big part of me that logo has been. But then this realization came over me that sent shivers down my spine. I said, in some small way, being part of the Mets Hall of Fame now means that in this minute fashion, I'm now a part of that logo in perpetuity. And I, I mean, that buckled my knees. And so that's what that day and its aftermath meant to me. And I look at that logo now in a different way than I ever did before. And it is as humbling as anything I can look at. Well, certainly a well-deserved honor. And what a what a great thing is to be in the Mets Hall of Fame. Thank you. Uh, we got some questions from the fans. Uh, the first one uh, actually came in on our email account, the Terry Collins Show at gmail.com. Hi, Howie. I grew up in the UK and came across the Mets by complete accident. A kid in school back from holiday in New York was sporting a Mets cap, so I heard of the Mets before any other team. What do you think is that magic ingredient that makes Mets fans so unique, given that their neighbors have won so many championships and like to talk about it so extensively? I think he answered his own question right there. You know, there is a unique identity to the Mets and younger fans cannot possibly understand what the Mets meant in New York from their very beginning in 1962. You know, the Yankees just come off of one of the great years in baseball history, 1961, as I spoke about before. But remember now, there were two fan bases in New York that were disenfranchised when the Dodgers and the Giants left just five years before the Mets played their first game. So whereas you might have no National League baseball in New York, a lot of those fans would have gravitated to the Yankees. That wasn't the case. The Yankees' attendance for those four interim years was flat. They didn't get any more fans because the Dodgers and Giants left. So the creation of the Mets was cause for major celebration. Casey Stengel did an incredible job of selling that team. And even though the Yankees were champions, the Mets, to a large extent, owned New York, even during some of those great years for the Yankees, and then on through until 1969, when the miracle of baseball miracles took place. And comparatively, you could not find a Yankee article in the newspapers back in those days. The Mets had such a stranglehold on the city as they did in the 1980s as well. So this whole business about the Mets being the little uh, kid brother to the Yankees could not be anything further from the truth historically. If it's been lately, that mindset needs to change. And I think under this ownership, yeah, totally agree. So we thank uh, Simon Harrow from Hong Kong for that question. And by the way, he loves listening to the games on his way to work in Hong Kong every morning. So I uh, got a fan far, far away. Uh, we have uh, one, one more question. This one comes from uh, uh, X, Sam Karras. Uh, what are your favorite Terry Collins stories uh, over the years of you covering uh, the Mets with Terry in the dugout? I got to tell you, they come so quickly. I mean, every day, just hearing Terry talk about whether it was Tommy Lasorda or guys in the Dodger organization or, you know, just other figures that he's crossed paths with over the years. Um, I, I can't think of one specific story that stands out above the others, but there is one common thread to all of them, and that is, that Terry Collins has for this game. You know, he has been all about playing the game properly, respecting not only the opponent, the teammates, but the history and the fabric of this game. And, you know, I look at Terry and I, I see somebody who, you know, could have played one of those baseball managers in the movies, whether in Major League or Naked Gun or any of those funny movies or The Natural because, you know, this man has been all about baseball and the reverence that he's had for the game is is something that's so special. And I, I just get a kick out of the fact that, you know, if Terry's popularity as a Mets manager was up here, when that video came out of Terry and Tom Hallion with, the you know, the ass in the jackpot and you got to give us a shot. I mean, Terry was never more beloved by Mets fans than he was after that video came out. But. He always had his players' backs. 
And even when they had relatively poor rosters in terms of at least to pennant contending rosters, um, you know, those teams always played hard for him. No Mets team or Mets player ever, ever, ever quit when Terry was the manager. He wouldn't let him. He had too much respect for the game. And through osmosis, they had too much respect for Terry to ever lay down. So, yeah, the individual stories of individual characters are great, and I've loved every one of them. But the overriding feeling that I get when I think of Terry as a manager is just how much he's loved and respected the game and how much that's come back to him over the years. Great. Thank you so much, Howie. Terry? That fair, Terry? Yeah, well, thank you, Howie, for that. Yeah, I, that is that is what I pretty am about. You know, I was uh, raised to, to respect the game. I, I mean, without it, what would you be doing today? I mean, what would I be doing today without – without the game of baseball. So once in a while, you got to give something back. And, and my effort was to make sure the game was played right. I, I said it in my, every interview I've ever had, you know, that the only thing I want is when a father leaves a ballpark with his son that win or lose the game, he says to his son, that's how you're supposed to play. That's the only thing I ever tried to do. So, uh, Holly, anyway, thank you so, so much for being on. You are you're Thanks for having a Hall me. of Famer, and it's uh, an honor. It was, it's, but it was an honor to be your friend. It was an honor to work with you. I learned so much, and and can't wait to have you come down, and we'll work on those ground balls you're hitting on that golf course hey, to get out and play. If if you ever have a problem with worms on your course, just call <laughs> me. I'm the exterminator. <laughs> we'll get there. I, I look forward to seeing you down there. And thank uh, you. Just, just thanks for having me. This was great. You thank bet. You so much, thank Howie. you very much. Howie Rose, that was an amazing interview. And Terry, uh, what a pleasure it was for me personally to to talk to Howie. And the synergy that you two have together is incredible. Uh, he's he's outstanding. And, you know, again, that's, that story, I'm going to tell you, John, that story I told about my friend that turns off the, the, t- the TV guys and turns on Howie. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that throughout the day, that people just love to hear him broadcast a baseball game. So it was a pleasure to have him on the, on the podcast. Yeah, it certainly was. And uh, now time for our Amazing Hero of the Week segment. Uh, we want to tell you about our presenting sponsor, Tunnel to Towers. The Tunnel to Towers Foundation supports America's greatest heroes, U.S. service members and first responders who die or are catastrophically injured in the line of duty and homeless veterans. They're all heroes we all owe a debt of gratitude to. The Foundation's Gold Star, Fallen Star Responder, Smart Home, and Homeless Veteran programs honor the sacrifices made for us by the men and women who've risked their lives and bodies for our country and for our communities. The Foundation's Never Forget programs engage people in 9-11 remembrance across America with over 80 runs, walks, and climbs a year, and dozens of golf outings and barbecues. The Tunnel to Towers 9-11 Institute educates kids in kindergarten through 12th grade about America's darkest day while helping our nation keep its vow to never forget. More than 95 cents of every dollar you donate to Tunnel to Towers goes to its programs. Never forget 9-11 or the sacrifices of our country's greatest heroes. Donate $11 a month to Tunnel to Towers at T2T.org. That's T, the number two, dot org. And on this week's segment, uh, Barstool Sports founder Dave Portnoy, and uh, now he's known for always going viral with his One Bite Pizza reviews, is highlighted for his charitable work. Uh, He's with Frank Sillar, the uh, CEO and founder of Tunnel to Towers. So let's go to the Tunnel to Towers Amazing Hero of the Week segment. Dave Portnoy is known as the founder of Barstool Sports and is known for his shop commentary and down-to-earth one-bite pizza reviews. Dave created the Barstool Fund during COVID and raised $50 million to help small businesses stay afloat. We have a South Beach on Staten Island too, by the way. Probably a little bit different. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> 
It means a lot to the Tunnel to Talos Foundation that you've taken your time to help us. It's a cause that resonates with our audience for sure. Like it really doesn't matter what your politics are. With the military, these people are serving our country and they need help. These great heroes that are willing to risk it all for us and our first responders that go out every single day. I say, you know, they give their kids a kiss goodbye and how many times they don't come home. Tunnel to Towers Foundation made a promise we're gonna help every single one of them in America. The United States is so much better than every other country in the world and the freedoms that people take for granted and it would not happen without people who risk their lives for this country and that's who you're supporting it. You know, we ask for $11 a month. 11 bucks, you have a full pie, you're good to go. You skip one pie. You skip one pie and you help a hero and the family that are left behind. Yep, and every dollar matters. What worked with the Barstool Fund? They knew they were giving us money and the money was going right to the businesses they want to give the money to. People knew where the money is going and we're 95.1% of every dollar that is raised goes to our great heroes. Yeah, and that's a huge part. I did all the research I've known about you guys, and you checked out, by the way, against Staten Island, all the people. I can show you my <laughs> phone right now, saying he's the only honest guy there is. I want to hear what you rate the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Right, which is always high pressure when I'm sitting right next to the guy. It's like, but we'll give a 10, even though I don't generally give 10s. That's a rookie score. But we'll give it a 10. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't a 10. So let's do good together. Let's do it. I'd like to ask you to contribute $11 a month by going to t2t.org or calling 1-844-BRAVEST. Our great friends over at Tunnel to Towers and what an incredible organization they are, Terry. They're tremendous. That, is, that was a great video. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing to do what I can to help out. And uh, I'm just, it's a pleasure to, to the fact that they take the time to try to help us out on our podcast. Yeah, and it's baseball initiative. You've cut a spot for them. And, of course, uh, Pete Alonso is running right now on the spot we did. And uh, John Gibbons and uh, we did John Franco at the uh, World Trade Center a few weeks back. And uh, we're so excited that we got Mike Piazza uh, on June 25th uh, uh, to do a spot as well. And and uh, former Yankee manager Joe Torrey is committed to do one as well. So we'll be up there with Joe that week uh, also. But we thank them uh, for their support here. And I encourage everybody to just go donate 11 bucks a month, T2T.org. And Terry, that's going to wrap it up for this week. Uh, another good one in the books. Uh, anyone special in the on-deck circle that you may be working on for future shows? Yeah, we got uh, someone who's very special to me. Uh, if it wasn't, with, wasn't for this man, I would have never – probably gotten back to the major leagues and had the tremendous experience I had in New York. We're going to have Sandy Alderson on next week. Uh, you know, he's responsible for every, everybody. You know, it's nice to be patted on the back about 2015, but it's Sandy Alderson who got that, that entire team, put that team together and uh, obviously did the right thing. Wow. I can't wait for that. That's going to be great to have you and Sandy together on this uh, podcast and uh, Terry, thank you very much again. Uh, we appreciate it so much. Uh, you could follow Terry on X and Instagram at Terry Collins underscore 10. And for all of you on Facebook, follow Terry there at the Terry Collins Show. Uh, you could follow me on X and Instagram at John Arizzi. And don't uh, forget to subscribe now to the Terry Collins Show on your audio platforms, especially Apple as well. You can give us a five-star review. We've had some incredible reviews up there posted recently. So uh, that really helps us out. Five-star review on Apple Podcast, And also subscribe to the Terry Collins Show on YouTube. Until next time, this is John Arezzi for Terry Collins. Have a great week, everyone. 